you guys want to open your uh, Bibles up to Exodus 12, uh, that's going to be our, our main uh, verses today there in Exodus 12. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I came in and uh, um, showed in Isaiah a direct prophecy to uh, Jesus Christ and, and the sorrow and everything that he went through on the cross. Um, today is, is a prophecy of, of Jesus Christ, but it's, it's also a perfect uh, picture painted by, uh, by God to Israel of what they were to look for uh, when their Messiah came. And um, here in, in, in Exodus 12, uh, just kind of give you a little bit of a background, uh, we see that Pharaoh uh, was fearing the Jews' population. He feared that they were getting so big in numbers that they would become his enemies. And because of that, uh, that fear, he enslaved them. But uh, he enslaved them to control them, but it wasn't uh, good enough for him. He had to try to commit genocide by killing all the newborn baby uh, boys. And in just one generation, there wouldn't be any more Jews to fear. Well, Pharaoh wasn't the only one to have tried this. You had... Um, the, the Roman Emperor Nero in uh, Peter's and John's last day try it. And then again with Hitler, he tried genocide of the Jews also in our recent history. And then the Antichrist is going to uh, try it again during the tribulation. But God's promise to Abraham stays. His promise to keep his descendants, give them a land, make them a nation, and protect them until their Messiah came back. That has always protected the Israelites through everything that they went through, and it will again during the tribulation. But uh, this first time under Pharaoh, God wanted to show them a way to salvation. He wanted to be, uh, make sure they understood what it would take for them to be saved. Because at this time, um, we, we get through all the plagues of God that Moses uh, warned Pharaoh about, and Pharaoh hardened his heart each time. So God said, okay, I'm done. This last plague is going to happen. I'm going to send a death angel through Egypt. It's going to kill the, the firstborn of every, every household. But Israel, I have a way for you to be saved from the death angel. And that way was the shedding of blood of an innocent lamb. The shedding of blood of an innocent lamb. Uh, in the Bible, all the way through the Bible, again and again, we are shown this comparison of the Passover lamb to Jesus Christ. And we're going to see if this, oh, i got to turn it on. Now. We're going to see if this thing is going to work for us today. There we go. So um, in John, everybody turns to the Gospel of John. The reason we, we make this uh, assumption, not, not assumption, this connection to Jesus Christ and a lamb is because of John the Baptist. John the Baptist brought it out to us so we as Christians could make that connection. He brought it out so the Israelites would make that connection, but they never, ever did. Um, in, in John 1, starting in verse 26, um, this is John the Baptist. He says, And John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom ye know not. He it is who coming after me is preferred before me whose shoes latch it, I am not worthy to unloose. These things were done in Bethabara, beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day, John seeth uh, Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. And then if you drop down to verse 36, it says, And looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold, the Lamb of God. He prints it out there pretty easily for everybody to understand. But the reason the Israelites never understood it because they had hardened their hearts to that. They weren't looking for a Messiah that was going to be sacrificed for them. They were looking for a Messiah that would be coming and being their king. And they had that stuck in their mind instead of seeing the beautiful pictures and prophecies that God had put forth to them. So today here in Exodus 12, we're going to see four things. We're going to see, you know, we tried this and it worked. <laughs> Go ahead, Jason. We're going to see stirring the will 
how the lamb was selected, and then we're going to see striking the heart, how the lamb was secured, and then startling the mind, how the lamb was slain, and last, stabbing the conscience, how the lamb was seized. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord, now. We thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for the prophecies that we can look back on now. And, and with the Holy Spirit and, and, and his help, we understand what you were trying to tell us. We understand what you were trying to tell Israel. And Lord, I, I, we thank you so much for that. Open our hearts uh, now, Lord, and, and help us to uh, really take this, uh, this chapter in and really be able to take it and, and apply it to our lives each and every day. Lord, we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So uh, the first thing we see here is, uh, let's go back. That's all right. We can stay there. Uh, the first thing we see here is, is stirring the will, how the lamb was selected. So here in Exodus chapter 12, let's read in verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house, take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your account for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep um, or from the goats. So the first thing I want to show you here um, is in, in verse 3, God says to be able to be saved from death, it's going to take a lamb. It's going to take a lamb. So we have to have an innocent lamb to be able to save us from death. And then in verse 4, he says it's the lamb. Not, it's not just any lamb out there. It has to be the lamb. And then in verse 5, it shows, he says, your lamb. It's not just the lamb, you have to make him your lamb. You have to make it personal in your life and make Jesus Christ, the lamb of God, your lamb, your savior, the one that you are going to follow for the rest of your life. So a lamb, the lamb, and your lamb is, is how God uh, starts this out. But let's go a little bit deeper into this because he says, if the household is too small for the lamb, they were to share that lamb with their neighbors and, and, and to be able to fully consume the whole lamb. But you got to notice that the lamb was never too small for the house. It was the house that was too small for the lamb. Jesus Christ is always adequate enough and even more for everyone to share with their neighbors and the ones that are around them. Next, we see that a rich man couldn't bring a bull for the sacrifice. A poor man couldn't bring a dove. It had to be a lamb. It had to be a lamb, and not just any lamb. It had to be the firstborn male of the flock and without blemish, without sin. Christ was God's lamb, his firstborn, the only son of God, and he was without blemish. He was without sin in his life. There are many testimonies within the Bible that tell us that he lived a sinless life from his father, his friends, his disciples, and even his foes had to admit that he lived a sinless life. You see, his father was pleased with him, in Matthew 3, Peter declared that Christ did no sin in 1 Peter 2. The chief priest had to make up false accusations against him just to be able to convict him in Mark 14. Pilate said that he found no fault of him in Luke 23. And Jesus himself challenged his enemies to prove he was guilty of sin in John 8 but they could not find any. He was blameless, without blemish, 
innocent and without sin. Now through faith in Jesus Christ, we can become sons of God in which Christ presents us as his church, as his bride, to himself, clean and without blemish. Turn to uh, Ephesians chapter 5. Yeah, Jason, I'm sorry, this thing's not going to work first. All right, uh, Ephesians chapter 5. Starting in verse 25. These are pretty common verses. It says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. It's because of Jesus Christ's sacrifice and his blood that covered our sins, as a church, we can be now sinless and without blemish. That doesn't mean we don't make mistakes. But if it's because of his righteousness that we put on, we are forgiven of those mistakes. And now we are without blemish. Just a side note here, husbands, really isn't the... The, the message, but it says, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Most husbands stop there. Yeah, I love my wife. I would die in her place. I hope every husband in here would say that. But this goes on and says that he uh, might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. Are you cleansing your wife? Do you love her enough to be cleansing her with the washing of the water by the word? Are you in the word with your wife? Just kind of a side note. Um, we're going to come back to Ephesians, so if you want to keep your finger there, you can. But um, let's go on back in our text. Uh, you know, there could have been some Israelites that uh, objected to this, that uh, they, didn't, they didn't want to kill their lambs. They didn't want to shed blood for their, for, uh, for their sins. No, they wanted to select their own way to salvation. They could have said, I'm a decent, moral, religious man. I pay my taxes. I, I give to the church. I've never killed. I've never um, uh, taken the Lord's name in vain. All that should be sufficient enough for my house. Or he might say, I'm the family priest. I've made several sacrifices in my lifetime for sins. That should be good enough for my salvation. Or even the Egyptian could have said, I wasn't told about the lamb. I should be excused from this punishment. But it all comes down to this. We cannot select our own way to salvation. And we cannot make any excuses for our own damnation. God is in charge. He has made the selection, and he has made the way, the only way to salvation. John 14, 6 says, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. The Lamb is the only way for salvation. It matters not what you think. God makes the rules. And and we are to follow those rules. And he told us our selection had to be a lamb. And for us, that lamb is Jesus Christ. Next in our text, we see striking the heart, how the lamb was secured. Chapter 12 and verse 6, it says, And ye shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. God's demand was for a lamb. It wasn't for a uh, ram, a large, uh, you know, a, a large ram that has curling horns full of obstinance and fight. Nor was he uh, demanding an old gray sheep that was tough and set in its ways. No, God wanted a soft, gentle, lovable, trusting, and obedient lamb. 
How could you cut that throat? How could you kill that? They were to take this lamb from the field and they were to parade this lamb uh, to their house and they were to secure it for four days. They did all this on the 10th day of the month. You know, Christ, on the 10th day of this very month, was chosen by his followers and paraded in from the field into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. For four days, the lamb would be taken care of fed, kept. The children might have even played with it, petted it, given it a, a, a pet name. It would have maybe even come part of a family or a friend. But on the 14th day of the first month, with bitter tears, the lamb would be slain, breaking the hearts of the children and in turn breaking the hearts of his parents. Jesus, too, on the 14th day of that first month was sacrificed for our sins. Christ too was slain on that day and he was breaking the hearts of his closest friends and his mother. He could look down on the cross and imagine the anguish and physical, um, emotional stress he was going under to look at the pain on the faces of his friends and family. We, too, have to come to him brokenhearted. We, too, need to be sorrowful for the things that we have done, brokenhearted for what he had to do for us and our sins. God secured a lamb for us. It was his only son. Why? Because he loved us so much. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. All we need to do is to believe in that. And we can have everlasting life. Next thing we see is a startling mind. Startling the mind. How the lamb was slain. Back in our text in verse 7. It says, And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper doorpost of the house, wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in the night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. You know, a skeptic once said, um, how can blood cleanse sin? And the Christian replied with his own question, how can water quench thirst? And I really needed a drink. I just didn't even plan that. <laughs> how can water quench thirst? I don't know, said the skeptic. It just does. Well, I don't know how blood cleanses sin either, said the Christian. I just know that it does. You know, especially right at first, God doesn't require you to fully understand his plan of salvation. Just that you believe it and you take it in on faith. As you grow in the spirit and become more mature spiritually, we do begin to see how God's plan unfolds. But to the lost man, to the lost man shedding of blood to cover up sin, it's startling to their minds. You know... They become blind to the truth. Uh, the Bible talks about three different people and how they are blinded to the truth. First, you see ones that are blinded by Satan in 2 Corinthians 4.3. But, uh, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, and whom the God of this world, that Satan, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. And then you have the ones that are blinded by God himself. We see that in John 12, 40, where he says, He hath blinded, he is God, he hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, and uh, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted and I should heal them. 
And then last, people blind themselves to the truth. Romans 1.21 says, Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. But not only does the fact that the lamb must be sacrificed boggle the mind of most people, but, uh, but the way it was prepared even boggles the mind of most Christians. It wasn't killed by bashing the head in. It wasn't killed by breaking or smashing the bones. It was drained of blood. And then that blood was sprinkled on the doorposts. They were to put the blood on both sides of the doorposts and then at the top of the doorpost. Go ahead, Jason. And um, this itself is a foreshadowing of the cross um, that Jesus died on, on, on that horrible day at Mount uh, Calvary. But the lamb um, here was, was sacrificed and the blood was put so forth so Israel would not see the significance of the cross. To make it even worse, the way they prepared the lamb was uh, they, they, they took a, 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 a staff of wood and, and they would take that wood and, and shove it down the spine of the lamb, not, not to be gruesome, but that's how they did it. They, they would put it down the spine of the lamb, then they would take another piece of wood and take it across the chest to open the chest up to the fire. Okay? It would look a little bit like this. A lamb hanging on a cross of wood. You know, the Israelites still prepare their lambs this way um, for the Passover feast, and somehow they still miss the significance of the cross. Yeah, it might be a little easier for us. We've got the Holy Spirit within us to help us learn this. We, we've got hindsight. We can look back upon there. But uh, Israel has blinded themselves to the truth. Then there's the fire itself. It was to be roasted with fire. You know, Jesus died on that cross. And then he went to hell. He went to hell to the, to, the, to the part of hell called paradise or Abraham's bosom. He went there to free the Old Testament saints. Um, look at uh, Ephesians. Because Paul kind of talks about this in Ephesians. Uh, chapter 4 and verse 9. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 9, he says, Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended far up, far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And then Peter later on tells us that he went down there to lead captivity captive. Those captives were the Old Testament saints, taking them out of the paradise of hell and bringing them into the new paradise of heaven. He faced that fire and got victory over it because he came back to life and got victory over death, got victory over hell, and got victory over our sins. Christ did away with the sin when he became our Passover. You see, not only did they have to roast it in fire, they had to eat it with unleavened bread. Unleavened bread. And matter of fact, they have to do away with leaven now before their Passover, seven days before the Passover dinner, getting rid of all that leaven in their house. Now, leaven throughout the whole Bible is a picture of sin. It's a picture of sin. So they had to do away with all the sin in their life, in their household, before they can celebrate the Passover. Look at Corinthians 5. Because, uh, 1 Corinthians 5. 
because uh, Paul brings this together for us to help us understand this picture. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 6, Paul says, Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that the little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with leaven of malice or wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Let's go back and read this, and let's uh, um, replace leaven with sin. It, it, it would read this way. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little sin sinneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old sin, that ye might be a new lump, as ye are sinless. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old sins, neither with the sin of malice or wickedness, but with the sinless bread of sincerity and truth. That unleavened bread that pictures Christ's body that we take at the time of, uh, of the Lord's Supper is a picture of an un. Uh, of, of a sinless life that Jesus led. Leaven equals sin. So they had to get rid of all that sin out of their house before they could partake in the Passover. The last thing they served with it was bitter herbs. Bitter herbs, just a reminder for us, the bitter sorrow that Jesus went through and that we should have in our hearts concerning the death of our Christ. The last thing we see here is stabbing the conscience, how the lamb was seized. Back in our text in Exodus 12 and verse 9, it says, Eat not, eat not of it, none of it, raw, nor sodden with all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs, and with the prutenance thereof. Now that prutenance is an old King James word, just means the innards, the liver, the, the heart, the lungs, uh, the kidneys. Everything was supposed to be eaten right along with the lamb. And ye shall let not, nothing of it remain until the morning. And that which remaineth of it until the morning, ye shall burn with fire. Not only were they supposed to kill the lamb, but it had to be eaten, fully consumed, every single part of the lamb. Now, we don't expect uh, Christ, uh, our lamb, we don't, we don't expect to eat him physically, fully, but we are expected to take him fully and faithfully and... and, and um, consume all of him spiritually. We need to fully consume Christ in our lives and let him consume us into his life. We need to spiritually eat his flesh, drink his blood, and make him part of us. Now, turn to John, because Jesus talked about this, and it's... It's really a, a, a gruesome chapter when, when, when Jesus talked about this. And it, you, you talk about startling your mind. Um, Jesus uh, really offended a lot of people when he talked about this. But they just didn't understand. And if you go to John chapter 6, starting in verse um, 47. John chapter 6, starting in verse 47. Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which come down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh which I will give for the life of the world. 
And the Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which come down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth this bread shall live forever. Now, if you didn't have the Holy Spirit within you and, and you heard Jesus say this, you probably thought he was nuts. How in the world could we eat his flesh and, take his, and drink his blood? And how in the world would that be enough for everybody uh, in, in the world to partake of? It's kind of gross, kind of yucky. Uh, you know, something out of a horror movie, right? Well, even his disciples were a little bit of offended of this because they just didn't get it. Everybody was looking at the physical. But Jesus was talking about the spiritual. So he had to lay it out for his disciples to make it clear to them. Drop down to verse 60. It says, Many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself, his uh, disciples murmured at it. He said unto them, Doth this offend you? What? And if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before, he, he, he's trying to say, uh, you're, all you're looking at is, is the physical. If, if, if I raise up into heaven, is that the only way you're going to believe me? He goes on. It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Spiritually, we are to consume all of Jesus into our life and let ourselves uh, be consumed by him. In doing so, we will have everlasting life and we will live according to his will. You know, we remind ourselves of this sacrifice when we share the Lord's Supper every time uh, we do that. We do that in remembrance of him. Are we actually eating his flesh and drinking his blood? No, it's, sin it's symbolic. It's spiritual. It's to remind us what he did and how we are supposed to be living. The last thing we see here in, in our text in Exodus 12 is verse 11 says, and thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Our salvation, after our salvation, we are to be ready with our loins girded with truth, our feet sawed with the gospel, uh, with the gospel of peace, and our weapon in our hand, which is the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Are you ready? Are you prepared at a moment's notice to go and do His will? Never forget what God has done. Never forget that He sent His Lamb, Jesus Christ, as our Passover sacrifice for our sins. Believe it. Receive it. Live it. Share it. And remember it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. So much for your word. Because without it, we would never have known what sin is. And without it, we would never have known the cure for that sin is the Lamb of God, your only Son, and the sacrifice that he made on the cross 
for us and for our sins. Lord, if there's anyone here that has never accepted you, fully consumed you into their life, Lord, let them stand boldly today and accept you now. And the ones that have accepted you, Lord, help them to be ready. Help them to be uh, ready to do your will and your service whenever you or your spirit calls them. Thank you again, Lord. We do thank you for all things that you give us. We thank you for leading us even in these times of trouble, Lord. Help us to have hope in you and in your future. It's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.